Okay, uh, thanks for uh, the organizer for uh, inviting me and thank you for the introduction. And I'd like to share with you uh, one of the major directions I'm pushing in the recent years. It's about a unified framework for analyzing some of these uh, I call event data from uh, social network, online social platforms. And um, uh, nowadays, uh, it doesn't matter which area you're working on, and you will invariably encounter uh, networks, right? Uh, if you work on social networks, you will definitely have lots of uh, uh, social network. And then even you work on things like transportation and computational biology or electrical engineering, you will also use network as a kind of abstraction for your data. You actually uh, analyze the structure of the network, static topology of the network. Uh, we understand a lot about the uh, static properties such as the degree of separation between the nodes and then degree distribution of the node, things like this. But actually, we understand very little about the uh, dynamic process uh, over these networks. If you look at these network, they are not just static network, but uh, actually, uh, even when these network structure remain pretty much static, stable, um, you see lots of activity generated uh, in this, this type of network. For instance, uh, if you look at Twitter, right, people are constantly retweeting. And not to mention about that, that there's also new account being created, that is the new node added to the network, and new link being created. And then this type of activity of a network, I call it uh, discrete events in continuous time. Essentially, at a particular point in time, people post it something. Yeah, people generate some contents in the network, upload to it. And then uh, these process happen in continuous time, right? So. Um, if you want to model such a data, right, um, one way to do it, uh, I can, for instance, just look at one of these users in the social network and then record it down uh, all these uh, information or content generated by this particular user. And uh, essentially, uh, you can record the content generated by the user by particular time points. And also, for instance, in this particular case, he tweet, this particular user, David, tweeted about something. And if I try to apply traditional time series modeling to deal with this type of data, then I have to first determine the so-called epochs. I have to divide the time axis into uh, epochs of some fixed length. And within the epoch, I have to somehow aggregate the data yeah, to come up with some kind of value such that you can apply the traditional time series modeling approach. Um, so the, then uh, when you try to design the size of the epoch, then you might have some questions such as, uh, what is the duration for this proc? and how large should it be? If there's no event within the epoch, how do I actually fill in the value? If there are multiple events um, happening in a particular epoch, how do I actually aggregate this information, right? And uh, another more serious problem is when you try to use traditional time series problem, the time is not modeled as some kind of random variable. It's just treated as some kind of discrete indexes. If you want to uh, answer something related to the time, for instance, uh, when the user is going to post an article next, post a message next, next and then when uh, these particular tweets is going to reach one million people, things like this, then it's actually pretty difficult to uh, actually uh, answer this type of question using traditional time series approach. Traditional time series approach is very good at um, you know, building a model and making prediction about the value of uh, the, the, the next value of the time series, but the, not as good in terms of modeling and answering questions such as when something is going to happen. So I'm going to show you a very toy example why temporal information is so important in social interaction. So this is a two hypothetical user and David and Sophie. Yeah, they are just tweeting uh, in a particular social platform. David said at uh, uh, 1 p.m. Uh, um, he, he discovered a cool picture and Sophie quickly responded to it in one minute and said, indeed, okay. Uh, David twist, uh, tweeted about something else funny, okay. And Sophie followed upon it very quickly, right, in, in one minute as well. And the next time, David also uh, tweeted about other things. Let's go for dinner together. And then Sophie actually answered it very quickly. So sort of in this interaction between, so between so David and Sophie, Sophie responded to the message of David very quickly. It sort of shows that some kind of inference uh, between David and Sophie, some sort of the inference from David and Sophie is strong, right? If I just uh, temper with the temporal information a little bit, the type of interaction you will see is very different. For instance, if uh, David tweeted about exactly the same contents, but uh, after 14 uh, minutes, and Sophie just uh, say something indeed, and then David follow up with quickly another uh, interesting joke, yeah, hopefully uh, Sophie will be interested, but uh, after quite some while, uh, Sophie just uh, replied to it, uh, yes. And then um, uh, David quickly followed upon it and say, how about we have dinner together? And um, after a long consideration, 
And the Sophie maybe reluctantly answered, yes, OK, uh, after 20 minutes. So the, the two uh, interaction, the contents of the tweets are exactly the same. But the, the temporal information is just uh, different. Uh, that shows very different type of inference between David and Sophie. So um, we need to model this type of temporal information in order to sort of figure out the inference between people, for instance, in this particular social uh, network, hypothetical situation. So uh, this temporal information uh, is important in this, per this particular situation. It's also important in many other applications, uh, not just in this tweeting uh, case. Um, it's also very useful when you try to deal with uh, the spread of the disease among populations. You'll be interested in the time, the, the critical time, or uh, you try to predict the time when uh, 100 people is going to infect it, right? You're trying to uh, model uh, the spread of this disease in time. Or in a cybersecurity setting, you, you wonder whether some computer virus will spread to 100 computers in a day or a week. So you will try to answer this type of question. If you use traditional time series, it will be difficult. So nowadays, we, we see this type of event data, um, which occur in discrete event, occur in continuous time, um, very often not just in this social platform. And in the network case, you also see in, in problems such as healthcare analytics. So essentially, if you look at electronic healthcare records, and uh, each one is patient visit to the clinic or hospital is actually uh, recorded in time, yeah, and also corresponding context, such as the type of disease the patient has. And if you are trying to model and understand the movement of taxi in the city, it's the same situation. You have the precise information, and in this case, even spatial information about when the taxi is uh, dropping off a, a passenger and when the taxi is uh, picking up a passenger, things like this. Um, you will try to sort of uh, perform this type of temporal uh, query. Uh, I call it temporal query, OK? So, um, so the question is, uh, given this large amount of diverse uh, sort of applications, you all collected some kind of precise temporal information, even spatial information, or additional context information. How do we actually model these type of data and um, learn and then perform inference based on the collected data and maybe perform some um, uh, prediction task later on, right? And predict even some kind of uh, control task later on. So we need a unifying framework to sort of analyze this type of data. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, sort of the, the work in my lab for the past five years uh, about unifying framework for modeling this type of uh, discrete event happening in continuous time. It can be uh, data collected from social network or data collected in just electronic healthcare records. So uh, I'm going to structure the talk in uh, sort of the four blocks and uh, at the beginning, I will give you a little bit of tutorial what is the sort of key quantity for modeling and thinking about this type of discrete event in continuous time. And I'm going to use an uh, example for, uh, social, from a social network and recommendation system. And in the end, uh, using some example from uh, online document stream to, to show how to actually use this framework for, for modeling and, and learning from data, okay? So what, what um, so essentially, um, when we try to model the, for instance, the activity of a user, the event generated by a user. So we actually just recorded this uh, precise timing and context information of the user, right? So we can denote the sort of the history of the user as just some HT. And what we are interested in is to perform some kind of uh, prediction about the temporal event when the user is going to generate the next event. So essentially, we want to predict the random variable time t, OK? given the history HT, right? So typically, uh, if you want to model this history, you can use something called counting process, NT. Um, essentially, every time there's one event generated by the user, you will have uh, the counts increased by one. So you also record a corresponding context, the uh, feature information, in this particular case, the text information um, associated to that particular time, okay? So, um, Traditionally, when we try to model a uh, random variable, right? So we would just use something called density to do it. So in this case, we just try to model the conditional density of the next time, the event of the next time, yeah? And then um, uh, given the history, right? So uh, essentially, what I'm drawing this curve is just the density. And then um, uh, the small stripe, the, the dark blue stripe over there, is just the probability of generating event at that particular point time t. And then uh, this area on the right-hand side of this uh, curve is going to 
we call something survival probability. It's the probability that the event hasn't generated before time t. So it turns out that uh, this uh, density function is not a good quantity, not the best quantity to model this type of uh, random variable about time in this context. So one reason, there are many reasons uh, you will see later. One reason that the density is not the best quantity is because uh, when we try to uh, use a probabilistic model for these uh, set of discrete events, uh, once we have the density, in principle, we can write out the likelihood of that particular sequence of events, right? So for instance, you observe David generate these uh, three events, these four events, T1, T2, T3, and T. And uh, you observe these uh, set of events in a time interval T, OK? So then uh, to write out the likelihood of this entire sequence of events, actually what you can do is you uh, evaluate the likelihood of the particular events at point T1, T2, T3, and T, and get, for the last interval, between T and the uh, observation window T, you just use the survival function. So typically in, in data mining machine learning, when we try to parameterize the, um, the density function, we use log linear model, right? We will use something like this, exponential family log linear model. And uh, the parameter is going to be W. And then and the psi here is just some sufficient statistical feature of the time, and sometimes even the context. And uh, when you do that, and then plug it back into this uh, likelihood function, you'll find that, uh, that the problem is uh, not, not con convex, not concave in this particular case. That means that when you have uh, lots of data points, you try to estimate the parameter w, there's no guarantee you will get a best w, OK? And it's very hard to design efficient algorithm in this case to find the global best parameter as well. Um, so the quantity you're going to use, actually, when you try to model this type of temporal event, is going to be something called intensity function. So it is just the ratio between this uh, density function f and then survival function s. So it is the conditional probability of something happening in a small time window t to t plus delta t, given that it hasn't happened before t. So it is that quantity h. Once you have h, actually you can recover the uh, density function f and also the survival function s. There's some one-to-one -one mapping relationship between them. But the advantage of um, using h is uh, this intensity function h it's a some non-negative function. You can parameterize it. Um, as long as it's non you don't need to normalize it. There's no this additional normalization factor you, you, you need to use for the uh, density function. And you can actually design lots of intuitive uh, intensity function, uh, depending on your actual application scenario. I'm actually going to show you lots of examples of this intensity function. You can design based on a particular domain you're working on. For instance, uh, uh, one advantage of H is going to be um, in terms of the optimizer, learning the parameter later, you will see. Um, you, here, here you parameterize, you actually have some kind of a, just a linear function in some kind of nonlinear feature space. This phi t is going to be some sufficient statistics of feature of time. And then you will just have this linear model. When, when you actually write out the likelihood using this intensity function, what you will get is a nice concave optimization problem. And uh, giving you lots of data, you will be able to learn the global best parameter. And you will be able to design efficient algorithm to learn it. But uh, um, what's more interesting is uh, you can actually uh, correspond this intensity function to some of the quantity you are familiar with in the literature, and even design some interesting new uh, intensity function to model a very complicated scenario. Um, for instance, uh, you might be familiar with Poisson process, right? So in this case, uh, the intensity function is just a constant. It doesn't depend on the time. It doesn't depend on the uh, history of this process. It's just a constant. And it says that the, the um, time interval between uh, the, these two adjacent events is uh, following some kind of independent and for exponential distribution, OK? That the event tend to spread sort of uniformly, evenly across time, OK? So uh, when you try to sample uh, from such a process, it's also very easy. You sample from first the uniform distribution and then transform it, OK, with the corresponding constant mu. So uh, there's also something called inhomogeneous Poisson process. Essentially, you try to model that, that maybe on Saturday uh, there are more events, and on Sunday there are more events than on the week compared to weekdays, OK? So you can just design some nonlinear function, which is a function of time, but that doesn't depend on the history, OK? So um, you can also control the number of events that you want to uh, be in this particular process. So essentially, uh, the way you do it, you use a not inhomogeneous Poisson process, which has an intensity function g star. And uh, by having this additional function, 1 minus nt there, 
NT just counts the number of events already in the process. And then if there's already one event, you zero out intensity. If it, is, it has no event, then uh, it's going to be one, okay? You're just, just going to take the value of g star t. So you can imagine you can control the number of events to be two, three, four, five, and set up about uh, capital M, uh, things like this. Then it, it is uh, a special instance of this terminating point process. Um, in models, the, the, the case when you only allow something to happen once or twice, for instance, a particular product, you can only buy it once, but not twice, yeah? So this is a very interesting sort of process that has been very popular recently in modern social events, especially Twitter data. It's called the Hawks process or self-exciting process. So essentially here, the process, the intensity function is going to depend on the history. And uh, it's going to depend on history in such a way. Uh, you first have a mu, a constant there, just like a, a homogeneous Poisson process. For every event happening in the past, so every TI in the history, and it's going to contribute one turn to the intensity function. So you're going to put this exponential function on top of each one of these events in the past. It's going to decay. If you have a lot of events happen in the recent past, the intensity is going to be high. Uh, otherwise, uh, it's going to be small, okay? So in this case, uh, uh, sort of it's very nice for modeling the uh, excitation you know, uh, between the events. In the past, for instance, you like particular type of video. You're going to watch the same type of video again and again in the recent past. Or you like the particular type of music. You're going to listen to this type of music uh, many, many times in the recent past, okay? Um, so uh, this Hox process, there's a not a nice sort of interpretation for it. It will actually help us to use this type of intuition to model the interaction between people. So, so far I've been talking about just the, the point process for individual user. Then you can actually put them together to model the interaction between people. The intuition comes from here. When you look at this uh, Hox process intensity function, or it's some kind of additive form, right? So it's sum over this mu, which is base intensity, and for each one of these events in the past, it's going to have one turn in it. So conceptually, you can think about uh, essentially the, the process is generated this way. So you have uh, essentially four different process, separate processes. Uh, one is just a homogeneous Poisson with intensity mu, and the other three are uh, with the intensity non-homogeneous, inhomogeneous Poisson process with intensity according to this exponential function. And then uh, each one of these processes is going to generate event independently. In the end, you only keep the event which uh, has the time which is the smallest, okay? So this uh, way of taking, generating event separately and taking a minimum corresponding to the, uh, the intensity which has an additive form. So you can actually take this type of additive intuition to uh, model the interaction between two people. For instance, uh, both David and Sophie is tweeting. Uh, originally, they might have self-excitation behavior. If they like particular thing, they keep retweeting about, uh, keep generating original tweets about particular thing. But you can actually make the uh, intensity of David depends on the intensity of Sophie. So the Sophie has some inference to the David, right? So HD here, uh, just the self-excitation intensity for David. Then uh, you can actually make the David's tweeting behavior depends on the Sophie. So the Sophie is going to trigger more retweets in David by just adding these additional terms, which depends on the history of the Sophie, okay? So you, you can actually make them work in the network as well. So uh, you can make it more complicated. For instance, uh, uh, Sophie is a particular saleswoman, and then David try to decide which product to buy or not, right? Um, and then uh, you can make the intensity of Sophie influence uh, David, yeah, by just having something like this, okay? So if uh, Sophie tweets a lot, right, uh, continuing saying that, that this particular product is good, it's probably going to sway the, uh, David to buy a particular product. Once David buys a product, he's not going to buy it again, okay? So you have these uh, terminating prime process in the front. Once David has generated that event, buying something is zero out intensity. So you can actually uh, combine all these. Uh, simple example I showed you earlier. This Poisson process, inhomogeneous Poisson process, terminating process, and Hawks process together, and then to make very complicated uh, processes and the modeling interaction between people. So recently we did something uh, interesting uh, as well, and uh, going a little bit beyond this uh, traditional parametric, uh, we call it parametric intensity function. We actually use a recurrent neural net to model intensity function. The way we do it is uh, we are going to uh, take these time intervals and then use some kind of neural net to produce some kind of latent representation and use this latent representation together with the new observation to produce new history and use this uh, history 
this is embedded uh, information or the hidden variable view to define intensity function. This is actually a paper in, in this KDD about, we call it neural point processes, okay? So essentially just think about it. The, U, the intensity function is just a nonlinear function of the history, right? You can define very complicated um, a nonlinear function, uh, non-negative function, and then you can, uh, if you know a lot about the, the actual domain, you would just use uh, the domain knowledge to design something sensible. If you don't know about it, then you use this very powerful nonlinear representation, which is recurrent neural nets, to actually capture the, 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 the inference of the historical events on the future events. So uh, in here, I'd like to give you a little bit uh, just advertisement. Uh, if you actually use this neural prime process to model these uh, New York taxi uh, pick-up and drop-up data, or you, you model the stock chain, and you model the stack overflow when uh, one particular user is going to post and question, answer question, or you actually use it for modeling the uh, electronic health care records, uh, when the patient is going to come in back for next check, things like this. So in the, all these four cases, if you use this neural prime process, it actually does much better than the uh, you know, traditional parametric models. So, um, so essentially, uh, in this chunk of sort of uh, tutorial, I try to tell you that there are many ways you can define the intensity function, and then you can all even make it the neural nets or deep learning approach, and you can capture a lot of different type of behavior uh, in your data, especially the temporal behavior, right? And uh, given all these uh, intensity function, it doesn't matter, it's a, it's a neural prime process, it's a Hox process, you can actually also sample from this type of process very easy using just the same algorithm. Essentially, here is an example where you have a Hox process. You want to sample when the user is going to treat next. Suppose you already have learned the parameter. Then what's going to happen is, um, so you uh, first compute the intensity uh, at the last time point when the event is generated. So this is the edge zero. I didn't know the edge zero. And then uh, you're going to sample from a Poisson uh, process, which is just transform the uniform distribution. And in the end, uh, you decide whether you actually want to keep that particular uh, observation using some kind of rejection sampling. The ratio between uh, your actual uh, Hox process intensity H star over this H zero, okay? So actually we use this type of simple algorithm just to generate uh, some kind of simulated network evolution traces, okay? So uh, now we have seen these basic building blocks then uh, what we want to do is actually uh, use these building blocks to model more sim sort of uh, realistic scenario. Yeah? We have lots of models on information diffusion, but today I'm just going to focus on one model, which is using it for modeling information diffusion and the coevolution of the network. So here uh, I also have this hypothetical sort of example where people are already following each other. In this case, uh, David is followed by Sophie, and Sophie also followed by David, for instance, in this case. In this particular social network, if David retreat about something, right, and then uh, it's going to be responded by Sophie uh, at some particular point in time. So uh, when you actually look into the Twitter message, it records the time of your retweets and also the source of the original tweets. So that's at D, right? So that was replying David's tweets. And then at some point in time, uh, this Christine is going to retweet uh, to this tree as well. And then Bob is going to retweet these original tweets from Davy. And Jacob is going to uh, retweet after 35 minutes of Davy generating the original tweets. So, but the, what's interesting in this social network is uh, people by um, add some following, a uh, follow e relationship. In this particular case, um, Jacob finds that Davy's information is very useful. Yeah? He can create actually a following relationship to Davy. And uh, the 1.45 p.m. That the time when a link is created is also recorded precisely in the, in the data set. So you actually want to model this process of retreating behavior, how retreating is going to uh, trigger the creation of new link, and how the creation of new link is going to actually uh, support the diffusion of information across this new, new network. So, um, so for instance, when this link is actually created, then when David retweet about, tweet about something, and Jacob is going to see very, very quickly, right? He sees it immediately and reply to it. Sort of the creation of this new link is also changing the way information propagates in this social network. You want to model uh, these two interacting processes. 
So how do we do that using this point process type of uh, framework and intensity function we just uh, sort of presented earlier? So essentially, you're going to present each one of these information, this event generated in the node network, using some kind of triplets. This triplet is going to recall the uh, source of that particular tweet and destination of the tweet, okay? Uh, the destination, source, and then uh, the time. So in this particular case, I ignore the contents, but later on I will have example. How do you actually incorporate contents in your models? And, and then uh, Jacob retweeted uh, David's original tweet at 135. That's why the corresponding triplets for David, Jacob is JD135. And at some point in time, Jacob also created a link to David. That's why the triplet is JD145, right? So um, um, of course, you will also have Bob retweeting uh, generated original tweets, uh, Jacob also going to retweet Bob, things like this. So in order to sort of represent and then recall this historical information, so what you're going to do is you're going to uh, associate with each user a collection of these, these timelines, okay? One for each one of these uh, information source. For instance, for Jacob, you're going to have uh, three timelines. In this particular case, he has retweeted uh, uh, himself, okay? Just generate original tweets. He has retweeted the tweets from uh, David, originated from David, and Jacob has retreated the Bob. That's why you have these three timelines. Sort of you already have some idea that um, you need to model the intensity for all these uh, three retreating behaviors. Um, we also want to model the evolutional network, right? So in this particular case, uh, Jacob can always create uh, some link to himself. Jacob may have created a link to David, and then Jacob may create a link to other users. So you also record it as some kind of a timeline, yeah? So you want to sort of design the intensity function which uh, sort of capture this coevolution between information spreading and also the network evolution. So how do we do that? So we are going to look into how do we actually design the intensity function for, for Jacob's retreating behavior. Essentially, Jacob is going to uh, retreat to Davy, and then we sort of recall these uh, retreating behavior as uh, counting process NJDT, okay? And then uh, whether Jacob has retreated to David depends on the information, whether the information has propagated to Jacob or not. So Jacob in this particular case already have two parents, which is Christine and Bob. And um, this adjacency matrix A is recording uh, whether Jacob has uh, connected to a particular parent or not. So this, this AJCT is, uh, is again some uh, function depending on the time, but the value is only zero, one, right? If it's one, then Jacob is c connected to Christine and Bob, right? So uh, then uh, whether Jacob is going to retreat David depends on uh, whether his two parents, Christine and Bob, has retreated David or not, right? So you can actually uh, sort of design this type of intensity function by uh, adding together the uh, retreating intensity of the two parents. So the first time is going to correspond into Bob's retreating of David's tweets. The second time is going to correspond into Christine's retreat to the uh, David's tweets. If both parents retreat in, um, you know, original tweets from David very frequently, and then Jacob is going to see it's more likely he's going to retweet something originated from David. So it is this additive form um, which has this uh, superposition type of idea we discussed earlier. So this is just a simple model for retreating. So you can actually also uh, use the same forms of you know, intensity function for Christine, Bob, and Sophie because they all retreat, okay? So once you have modeled this retreating behavior of a particular user, then uh, you can actually use this uh, retreating behavior to drive the creation link. Essentially, the intuition is if Jacob retweets some original tweets from David very often, Right? But Jacob have never connected directly to David. Then it's more likely that, that Jacob finds the information from David useful and directly follow David. Okay? You just try to model that intuition. The way you can do it is um, something like this. So the intensity is designed as some kind of um, superposition of terminating point process and Hawks process. So first you check whether there's already a link between uh, Jacob and David, right? Whether Jacob has already followed you or not. If he has followed David, then um, you are not going to follow again, right? So here we are not modeling the link deletion process. Actually, you can actually incorporate that uh, into the model as well. And, and the second turn here is essentially modeling the uh, sort of intensity of Jacob retweeting David. If Jacob retweeted David very often, it's going to be more likely to connect to David, right? But once it's connected, it's going to be uh, zero out of intensity, okay? It's not going to connect again. So there's this additional mu here, which is essentially uh, just Jacob's random exploration. 
So Jacob can just create a da uh, Davy by just randomly exploring the this Twitter space and connect to someone, okay? So you can actually model uh, this uh, interesting sort of interaction between the information diffusion network, the network structure, which is uh, this adjacency matrix A, evolve over time as well. And uh, on top of this uh, temporal evolving network, um, you, you support the spreading of information, this retweeting behavior. And the retweeting behavior is going to drive the creation of links, yeah? Once the link is created, it's going to change the, this diffusion network, and then the, then the information is going to propagate in a different way. So essentially, with those very simple components, you can actually model this complicated uh, convolution between network structure and then a spreading of information. So there's some other nice properties. Uh, I don't get a time to talk about it. It's, the estimation of parameter is actually convex, okay? It's actually very easy to estimate parameter efficiently. Even you have a, a network of millions of nodes or even larger or lots of tweeting uh, data. You can actually estimate parameter very efficiently. But what I'm going to show you a little bit more in the, this particular example is the sort of simulation results, right? So essentially you, you will have, you can actually simulate the sort of the information spreading process and link creation process using this model, just following that simple sampling uh, uh, sort of uh, recipe I gave earlier. So uh, in this particular case, node blink corresponding to the intensity, okay? Sometimes you, you see that it's, it's dark red, then it's, it's actually retreating very uh, intense, intensively. And then at some point there's a no edge created and that's due to the retreating behavior. So you can actually simulate this type of network based on the uh, the, this very simple generative model. And uh, the one very interesting thing is uh, you can actually generate a network of different behavior just based on this model. Changing this um, parameter alpha d, essentially this alpha d controls uh, how much random exploration that particular user has. He might randomly create a link to a user or he might create a link just based on retreating behavior. If you allow the user just to create random sort of link, you can actually recover the, this uh, early running random graph, yeah? Use a lot uh, previously. And then um, if you allow this retreating behavior to drive stronger uh, the link creation process, you actually get some kind of nice scale free network. So you can uh, smoothly interpolate between this random sort of graph model and then um, uh, scale free network just by changing how much you want this retreating behavior to drive the creation of links. Here I'm just showing a snapshot, a steady snapshot of the network, but it, the network is actually generated in a temporal fashion, right, as you see in the last slide. So you can do some simple statistics and look at the degree distribution of the nodes, and these dots are the actual data computed based on these, uh, these generated data. And in the first case, uh, these uh, dots can be nicely fitted by some kind of exponential distribution, and then um, Poisson fit, yeah. And then in the second case, you actually need a power law feed to the degree distribution, okay? Um, so there are many other properties you can, you can measure and then see whether it's sort of consistent with the, some of these properties we have empirically demonstrated in, in real world network. For instance, you can look at the, the patterns of the cascade, right? What kind of uh, uh, cascade is more often? So uh, in some sense, there's also some parameter in the model which can control the type of cascade, the, the abundance of the type of the cascade. Um, if you al allow lots of uh, retreating behavior, you will actually get, uh, get uh, if you increase this alpha, then you will actually have more of this fat cascade, yeah, than, than, uh, than having a small alpha, okay? So uh, another example, uh, this is sort of using the intensity function framework for uh, modeling the convolution. So you can also use it for recommendation tasks. In this particular case, uh, it is an online uh, shopping example, and then there's a bunch of users and purchasing a bunch of products. So typically you would do it using matrix factorization approach, right, collect the data, or you divide the time into epochs and do a bunch of matrix factorization. So actually, uh, when you think about it, when uh, a customer purchases a particular product, at the precise time that this particular customer purchases a product is recorded in the database. So essentially for each customer and product pair, you have a timeline, right? Recording exactly when this patient, this particular customer is buying a particular product. And uh, you can model it with this uh, point process. For instance, one particular model is actually modeling particular user David buying object one, yeah, uh, as a Hawks process, right? So if, uh, if 
this particular user, they buys this type of product very frequently, then it's likely that he's going to buy the same brand or same type of product again and again. You have this self-excitation. So for each pair of user and product, you have such a prime process. The primary is going to be this mu uh, base intensity, and also this alpha controlling the strength of self-excitation. So if you think about all possible combination of user and item pair, it's a, it's a big matrix, right? It's a matrix of parameters, very similar to what you have in the recommendation system. But in this case, you're more on a temporal behavior, buy-in behavior. So in order to make this estimation pr possible, um, you will actually need to put some regularization on these collection of parameters in order to be able to estimate uh, robustly the parameter from data. You will put some kind of lower regularization on these mu parameter and also the alpha parameter. So then uh, when you have uh, millions of users or thousands of users and thousands of items, right? Then here comes the question, how do you actually estimate parameter from uh, such a uh, process, right? And uh, in this uh, sort of uh, chunk of examples, I'm going to talk about how do you actually estimate it efficiently uh, from the data by designing some kind of efficient optimization procedure. So uh, the, what is the problem? The problem is uh, although uh, with this uh, intensity, primary, when you parameterize an intensity function, you get some uh, nice concave optimization problem. You have this additional regularization parameter there, and it is actually not an uh, easy optimization problem comparing to regression classification task. The problem is this log term is causing a problem. So this log term, when you actually, the, the value inside the log goes close to zero, then uh, the, the, fun, the slope of the function gets larger and larger, right? So it's a non lipschitz function in, in terms of optimization that's difficult. If you want to sort of recover the parameters of the model up to epsilon uh, accuracy, you actually need to go through one over epsilon squared number iterations. For instance, if you want to have 0 0.01 accuracy, then you have um, a 1 over 0 0.01 square, right? You have 10,000 iteration, things like this. Ideally, you want something like 1 over epsilon, or 1 over, uh, log 1 over epsilon, something like this. So it turns out that uh, once you model with the intensity, you can actually, uh, and you get this convex optimization, you can actually bring lots of tools from convex optimization to make these uh, run faster, estimating parameter faster. So one, one particular approach we designed is uh, reformulating the problem to some set of point problem. So, so uh, in the previous slides, I explained the problem is caused by this log function, right? So we sort of want to pull out this parameter outside of the log function. The way we do it, we introduce something called the conjugate function for this log. So essentially expressing the function log in the product between your parameter w and phi as the solution of some optimization problem. So it's going to maximize over this additional dual variable mu uh, and then you're going to do a product between this mu and this inner product w and phi t, and then you have this log mu there, okay? You introduce the additional variable. So once you replace all this log by this, uh, this additional dual optimization problem, you get something like this. So you try to minimize with respect to the original w parameter and maximize with respect to this newly introduced dual variable mu, right? So you get this uh, optimization problem when you try to minimize with respect to one set of parameters, but maximize with respect to another set of parameters. But it's still a uh, convex uh, uh, sort of optimization when you fix one set of parameters and look at the other parameter. So here, uh, I'm not going into the detail, but uh, we have a new paper, which is essentially uh, using something we call the mirror prox gradient descent. You'll be able to actually bring the computational complexity of uh, running the primary to epsilon uh, close to uh, you just need one over epsilon uh, steps to, to, for the convergence, okay? So what is the benefit of uh, having a faster optimization procedure? So we tried some data set, for instance, this uh, last FN data, data set, where you have a user listen to music and you use Hox process to model the people's behavior of listening to a particular uh, album, okay? And you have this uh, gigantic collection of a uh, user versus an album type of uh, parameter matrix. If you estimate it with this new uh, sort of algorithm, the convergence curve is going to be the red one, okay? If you uh, just use mirror descent, just like gradient descent with projection, and then for this set of point problem, then you get this broad curve. So the convergence is much faster. If you run uh, the same number iteration, you get much accurate solution. Okay, so later on, uh, I will show you that uh, running this algorithm, you actually get, also get a better prediction in terms of um, 
next item prediction and return time prediction. So what do I mean by that? So essentially, uh, you have this model, right, of people's uh, temporal behavior of buying particular products. And once you have learned such a model from data, then you can actually use it for making two type of predictions. One type of prediction is predicting uh, what is the next item this particular user is going to buy. And then the second type of prediction is uh, when he's going to buy it, okay? So typical recommendation system will give you answers such as um, what buy they will buy, okay? And then, um, um, but it's, it's typically not giving you answer like when he's going to buy it. But since we have modeled the temporal behavior of David using this point process, we can actually make this type of prediction of returning time, okay? So the way you do it is once you have this intensity function between each user and object pair, item pair, then the, what is the next item to buy is just going to look at this intensity function um, across, for a fixed user across the items. Which item has a high intensity? It's more likely, yeah? Then it's going to be the item that is more likely to, to be purchased. Okay, you just maximize over O for a particular prime point T, okay? So that, that's also time specific or temporal specific query. So if you fix a different point T, for instance, if you fix time to be one week, it could be a different item uh, compared to fixing time to uh, one month, okay? So when you, when you try to predict the return time, essentially you just uh, compute expected time, okay? Compute expected time of buying that product, particular product, okay? Since you already have this generative model of your temporal behavior, you can actually compute the quantity and making that prediction. So once we do that, so um, we, we use it uh, for this particular last FM data. Uh, unfortunately, it's not as big as industry scale, but it already contains 1,000 users and 3,000 albums. And then um, um, it's, uh, you observe actually uh, 20K pairs of user and item interactions. And in total, there's one million this discrete event happening in continuous time. If you use these, uh, we call it time-sensitive recommendation uh, approach based on point process. So you can predict the, uh, the next album to listen much more accurately than um, other approaches such as just learning a self-exciting point process for each individual without considering the collaborative effect or using a Poisson process which has been used in literature or based on tensor factorization by dividing first the time into epochs and use the tensor factorization. You're, you do much better uh, comparing to these uh, approaches. And uh, in terms of returning time prediction, you can also compare to some of these uh, approaches which you augmented uh, with the temporal information. Um, so besides this uh, music recommendation example, we also tried other type of data. Essentially, uh, when you look at the healthcare record, each patient is going to visit the, uh, the hospital for a particular type of uh, disease, okay? So you have uh, 650 patients and 200 diseases, okay? And then you can actually predict uh, when the particular patient is coming back and then what reason he's coming back, things like this, based on these uh, electronic healthcare records. In this particular case, this Lorentz Hawks process is also doing much better, okay? So this is about uh, sort of uh, having a big model, right? So like a collective fusion model, and then you optimize this parameter using efficient convex optimization. And uh, the next sort of uh, example I'd like to give is about the, yeah, the uh, sort of the use additional information. So previous sort of examples, I've been using exclusively temporal information, but uh, there are many other information besides this temporal information, such as text and speech, maybe image upload, a video upload, and maybe some other time series uh, together with this temporal event data. So we can also actually incorporate this type of uh, additional information with this temporal information. So we have, uh, for instance, this, this particular application where you have a stream of documents or news articles. Each news article surface online in particular point in time, it also has contents. What you want to discover from these online streams of documents is going to be, uh, you know, a cluster uh, of documents belong to a particular topic, and you also want to look at temporal intensity of this particular uh, cluster. So you can actually design something we call the ratio Hox process. By combining these uh, Hox process, for describing temporal behavior with this Dirichlet process typically used uh, in non-parametric base for describing the creation of clusters. So essentially what we are going to have is going to have this green, you know, timeline uh, there. Essentially is uh, modeling the generation of new clusters. And then um, uh, at a particular point in time, uh, you can have already generated cluster one, 
uh, with parameter theta 1, topic parameter theta 1, and cluster 2 with parameter theta 2. And then it has a particular set of uh, documents associated with it. So you will have the corresponding intensity for each one of these documents. Then when there's a new uh, document comes, yeah, the generative process is going to determine um, when, where, where, which cluster this new document should be assigned to. So you are going to actually use the intensity function uh, to assign this particular uh, document to a particular cluster. So this is, uh, uh, and then uh, essentially, the, instead of using the number of documents in the cluster, you use the temporal uh, information, the intensity function, to determine uh, when to assign a particular document to where to assign a particular document. If that particular uh, cluster has uh, lots of uh, behavior activities, it's a hot topic, then it's more likely that right, the new document is coming from that hot topic, essentially. So I'm gonna skip this uh, detail, the generative process, and this is some kind of result you can obtain uh, from this dirichlet hox process. You'll be able to extract topics from your new streams, and you are also going to extract something like a temporal behavior of this particular cluster. For instance, you can extract a story like a movie, Dark Knight, in the second column, and then the sort of uh, the temporal behavior has some cyclic behavior for around um, uh, 20 hours, things like this. So this is something you can do by combining this temporal process with some other additional generative model for uh, text data, right? Um, essentially, uh, I'd like to end uh, here. So what I have represented to you is some kind of uh, unifying framework for model these type of temporal events uh, happening, uh, discrete event happening in continuous time. So you can uh, make lots of uh, interesting building blocks based on your intuition about what kind of behavior people may have. You can put them together, super superimpose them together to generate, uh, to model very complicated yeah? um, behavior in the network. So uh, the nice thing is you get some kind of uh, typically convex optimization for the model you have. You can actually also estimate the parameter of this model from data very efficiently. You can leverage lots of tools from optimization to uh, allow you to estimate parameter from large scale data. So once you have this, you can do uh, time sensitive prediction task, and then you can also combine this type of uh, model with uh, additional uh, generative model for text, uh, image, things like this. So, uh, so this is uh, pretty much uh, what I want to present. If you want to try out some of this model, we also have already built it into a C++ package called PDPack, and uh, now it's hosting on one of my students' GitHub page. And you already have some of this example I talk about uh, building into this package. If you want to sort of try out or extend it, uh, you're welcome to, to try it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, so we have time for uh, one to two questions. So I'll start one first. Uh, when you talk about the healthcare application where you are looking at the mimic data set modeling the disease and the patient, can you be more specific about uh, what exactly the modeling process for patients together with the disease? Right, so essentially uh, for these electronic healthcare records, the scenario is actually similar to the music recommendation. You have each individual patient has ID. And then what's recorded for this particular patient is lots of clinical visits. And each one of these visits has a disease code assigned to it. So you go to the hospital, the doctor look at you and, and diagnosis with some disease code. So you try to essentially, the, the, the disease code is shared across the patients. You can think about the disease code as the item. And then you have this matrix of particular patients have that particular disease at particular point in time. And uh, you just do this uh, point process modeling for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK. okay. Uh, any other questions? OK. Thank you. I have a question. Um, uh, in, in the example of uh, music recommendation, for example, right. uh, how would you model the blocking effect of some events? For example, like uh, some users are listening to an album, but we don't know like how long they are going to listen for that. And within those uh, period of hours where they are listening for this sound or this music, then we are basically can't really pre uh, predict anything that's going to happen other than they are listening to the current sound. How would you like modify these uh, things? So you are saying that uh, when, when the particular user listens to a music, it might take uh, some time yeah. to listen to it. And then you are uncertain about the actual activity of the user. 
Yeah. Yeah. So th this is currently no model here. Potentially, mm -hmm. you can actually incorporate a latent variable, sort of, uh, which trying to model the time that the users spend on that particular piece of music. And uh, we have uh, actually uh, some technique to do inference with the latent variable as well. And then potentially you can augment it with it. Yeah. Right. So, so maybe some extra models to kind of, kind of like uh, offset this kind of like uh, uh, average expected uh, duration of like how long an event could take, right? Average. Um, or so, 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 so something similar to that. Yeah. You, you treat it as something, you have some latent variable, which is listening time, right? Uh -huh. And then um, uh, essentially uh, you can infer between, you know, uh, first you have some prior over this time, maybe the length of this, this music. And then uh, you actually observe the user's behavior, and right. then you can infer the, this hidden variable. Um, you can also compute expected time that the, he is going to listen to the particular music, things like this. Right? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, okay. So uh, if there's no more questions, let's thank uh, La Song for the talk. Thank you. Thank you.